Hi, my name is Nikolai Yusupov, and in this video, I'd like to show you how to intubate somebody who has a traumatic injury, and specifically who has a cervical spine injury. Now, if you notice, this uh, patient is, is having a cervical collar in place. Now, you may get this uh, patient brought to you by the, you know, the fire department firefighters, or the BLS has already applied the cervical collar. The problem uh, here is that uh, if I want to even employ my basic life support procedures, such as a jaw thrust, you notice that the C collar is not allowing me to do a good mandible displacement, right, in order to conduct a proper jaw thrust. More importantly, if I want to instrument the airway with my blade, uh, this uh, cervical collar would not allow uh, for me to displace the mandible once more, right? So for us to intubate and to have the best view of the vocal cords, the cervical collar has to come off. But we cannot do so unless my partner regains C-spine stabilization. So how this will look is as follows, right? I'm, uh, I'm gonna have him perform a, a MILS technique called a manual inline stabilization. And he is gonna take essentially earmuff approach. He's gonna put his hands on the ears and not on the mandible, so it's freely movable. So he's gonna go ahead and do that, uh, apply the earmuff approach. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove, right, the cervical collar, the front portion of it. Now, once it's off, right, you could see that the mandible is now uh, is able to be moved. Uh, he's not engaged on it, and he's doing earmuff approach. Now, if I, if I was going to pre-actionate them, what I would do is I would essentially take the mask because this is the skill component of it, right? You apply and you do a jaw thrust like so, right? And my partner is going to connect, and she's going to ventilate, right? One breath every uh, five to six seconds when you're pre-actionating. Uh, now. Important here is this, right? Uh, you may not have enough strength to maintain this for a prolonged period of time. So, right before I say six, I'm going to engage it. So I'll say two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, five one thousand, six. So I engage the mandible right before she closes. But let's say we resuscitated this person that his saturation is let's say ninety five percent, right? And now we want to perform uh, endotracheal intubation. So this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to remove the bigold mask device, right? I'm going to take away my uh, OP anatomically. Then we're gonna use a video laryngoscope so you guys can visualize it. So I'm using a cross finger technique, right? So essentially open the mouth. I'm not anywhere near on the teeth. I don't want them to bite me, right? I'm using my blade. I'm gonna come from the side and I wanna displace my tongue, right? Again, the technique is essentially going forward, forward until you see the sliver of the epiglottis. I see the sliver, I put my blade into the molecular, right? and I do some ELM in order to see it. But you, as you can see, my view is not so great. This is why we're gonna utilize uh, elastic gum bougie, or another name is endotracheal tube introducer. Now, when I come in with this device, if you notice, if I'm in the trachea, yes, you may feel some tracheal rings, but the best way you know you're in the right place is you're gonna get hold up. Hold up is usually right main stem bronchus. And you notice I cannot advance any further, right? I know I'm on the trachea. Now, let me show you what happens if I inadvertently place this in the esophagus? So now you see it goes below the trachea, right? The, the notch here, right? And I'm going into the esophagus. See how far down it goes? I could bury this thing in the patient, so I'm in, a, in the wrong location. So you're gonna come out, right? Go back, right? Engage. I know I'm in the right place, I have hold up. Once I have hold up, I know I'm in the right place. I have my partner now place the endotracheal tube, right, over the gum bougie. Very important that the person, the operator, maintains his hand on the laryngoscope blade, okay? And uh, one thing I wanna say, right, here, if you notice, if you look at the bevel, right, if your endotracheal tube is pointing down like this, the bevel can get caught on the pre-laryngeal inlet, right? So what we wanna do is when we load up our endotracheal tube, we wanna point this tip so it's facing like this, right, down. Not to the side, like you see how it's gonna get caught? You wanna face it down. And I'm slowly gonna advance it. And my partner is gonna hold the tip, right? So as I go in, right, I go ahead and I pass it into the wall, of course. What I meant by rotating it, look, if I go back out, this tip can get, get caught on this inlet, right? So the technique is pull back, rotate to the left, and go forward. And now we're in the right location, right? So I saw, I saw it on the video laryngoscope, uh, and uh, I saw it on my screen. Now I can take out my blade, right? I'm going to go ahead and inflate my cuff, right? My partner is gonna go ahead and take out the tube, right? And check the tube introducer. I'm gonna right away connect my capnography, right? Which is connected to a monitor, obviously, right? And, uh, and throughout this whole thing, my, 
my partner here is maintaining the MILS procedure, right? I'm just gonna borrow your stethoscope to auscultate lung sounds, right? Thank you. So, I wanna hear negative epigastric sounds. Good. Positive. Good. Positive. So I have confirmed that I have positive breath sounds, negative epigastric sounds. I saw that my entitled CO2 was uh, 35. That I know that I am in the correct location. Now we're going to go ahead and secure our, our, our Thomas II holder. So I already have it loaded here. Very important when you place this, you want to make sure the bite block right uh, does not engage in your lip uh, because it can cause uh, trauma. It can cause ulcers. And very important, this opening has to be towards the feet. So I, I open the mouth. I engage this like so, right? Uh, and very important, I don't want to start securing this yet. What I want to do is I want to first secure this device right to the patient right so here I go through here right then then once I'm when I secure this I can go ahead put my tube into the it's called the V wedge and I secure it like so the reason for this is that if you first secure the tube and then you start manipulating this, you may start moving it and you may dislodge it. So when this is this is in place, I want to again reconfirm entitled CO2 lung sounds. If they're in place, uh, I'm going to put this, this is the pilot bone, and this is, these holes here on the endotracheal tube is where I could basically slide this in, so it's not in the way. Then I'm going to go ahead and take my front piece of my cervical collar. I'm going to again realign this. I'm going to realign this and I'm going to go ahead and secure it. And throughout again, the entire procedure, my partner was maintaining C spine control, right? Uh, in case this patient did, in fact, have any type of trauma. So, this is how you would intubate somebody who has potential cervical spine injury and not further compromise it.